Hi, I'm John. I'm from Iowa. Judd Wilhite was here. Ed Stetzer was here. Scott Rideout was here. I'm John. I'm from Iowa. No, I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, five years ago, I was uh, sitting right there, and, and we had this, this call to how many, how many churches can we plant? How many campuses can we launch in the next five years? And I can remember sitting out there, just, just my head just swimming, my, my heart kind of aching for my state. And, and I, I waited, and I waited, and, and, and there were people who were coming up, and they were handing out these batons, you know, to people, and, and you know, like, pass the baton, who are you going to pass the baton on to? And, 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 and I remember just sitting there, and sitting there, and sitting there, and finally I got up, and, you know, I was praying, and I got up, and I, and I walked down, and I said, give me five. <laughs> the guy looked at me, five? Yeah, give me five. Two weeks ago, our elders voted. We just launched our sixth campus. Two. Okay? Now, no, no, no. All that to say, when, when God calls you to do something, he's going to put it on you, and, and you're going to do it. And before we walk out of here today, I, I, I want to just spend a few minutes with you, and, and I just think that there's some, there's some check boxes that we need to kind of get straight in us because we're going to walk out of here, and we're going to make this next year Maybe the best year, maybe the most important year that Converge has ever had. I know you've been hearing about it and, and, and we've been talking about it, but, but we really are on the, on the cusp, I really believe, on the cusp of, of really doing, doing some great things across our country. And, and my prayer, and we, what we've been praying about, is that this would be kind of the launching point um, for us to, to come back next year and be simply amazed at what God can do. Be simply amazed. And so I, I just wanna, I wanna just bang away at it and, and let's just get going, okay? So, so here's what I, I wanna do. If, if everybody would just turn to Joshua 1, okay? Just go to Joshua 1. And, and here's, what, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna do just three check boxes that, that I just wanna make sure we're, we're square on before we, before we walk out of here and, and, and make sure we're all kinda heading the, 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 the same direction, okay? So here's something that just kind of the, 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 something that happened to me that I've just never, ever forgotten. Several years ago, we were driving back from Wyoming to Iowa, and my folks lived in Wyoming. And you know when your kids are little, and, and they just drive you insane in the car, right? So, so we had these three kids, and, and, and they were like eight and six and four, and, and, and we didn't have, this was way back, we didn't have DVD players for our cars, you know, nothing like that. And, and so we would drive at night. So it's an 800 mile trip from Sheridan, Wyoming to, to Cedar Falls, Iowa. And, and so we would drive at night and here's what I would do. I would load up on, a, on, a, on, on, on Mountain Dew, sunflower seeds. We'd load our kids up with cough syrup with codeine. <laughs> it was glorious. I'd put the headphones in, listen to some book on tape. And, and we were driving, and, and, and so we're coming across South Dakota. This is after Christmas, so this is like January 1 or 2. And we're coming across South Dakota, heading east, and it's the dead of the winter, and, and there is absolutely nobody on the interstate. And we come across, and we get to Mitchell, South Dakota, and it's, and it's another like 60 miles to Sioux Falls. And you know, I had this van that had this, this thing up here that said, how many miles till empty? And, and it said I had like 80 miles. And they were sleeping. I didn't want to disturb them. And so about five miles out of Sioux Falls at three o'clock in the morning, moron of the year runs out of gas. First moment, my wife woke up. What's wrong? Oh, uh, nothing. I'm just checking something. And it was like the lunar landscape. It was just, it was snowy and it was, the moon was, it was, it was, it was scary. And, 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 and so I, I just said, okay, I ran out of gas, but I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it. And the kids all wake up and what's going on? And you know, the car's not stopped now and it's January and it's South Dakota and it's the winter and it's already starting to get cold. And, and, and I'm starting to feel like more of a moron every minute. 
And so I wait, and I, there's a truck coming. So I, I, hop out of the, I hop out of the car, and I run over, and the truck's coming. I'm like, oh, man, surely, right? Surely. Three times this happens. And now I'm starting to panic, right? I get back in the car, and here's my reality. My reality is I'm in the middle of stinking South Dakota in the middle of the winter, and I've got three little kids in the car and my wife in the car, and we could all die. We wouldn't really die, come on. But that was reality for me in that moment. And, and so, like every godly man and godly leader, I, I planned. I looked at my wife and I said, all right, you get out there. <laughs> Seriously, here comes a truck. My wife hops out. It was awesome, all right? Now, before we walk out of here, first checkbox, okay? First checkbox is this. What is our, I'm a horrible writer on the whiteboard. What is our current reality, okay? What's the current reality? Everybody go to Joshua 1 and, and, and just look at, look at Joshua 1 with me. And so you all know the story, right? This is the, the great thing about this group is I don't need to like, okay, here's Joshua. Okay, here, here, here's the story is they've, they've wanted for 40 years. Joshua's the appointed leader. So they, they get to the, the edge of the promised land and right because of, because of Moses' sin and, and, and he was not gonna be able to enter the promised land. It was gonna be Joshua's job to do it. So they get to the, you get to the end right before this happens. You get to the end of Deuteronomy and, and, and here's what happens. Moses dies and they, and they have this big deal and they take him off and they bear him to be with his ancestors. And then you get to Joshua 1, and this is, the, this is maybe the, one of the greatest lines for me in all of Scripture. So look what it says in 1.1. It says, so after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, here it is, hear, hear this reality, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, I'm Joshua. Really? I, I didn't miss that one. And, and it's there, and you're going, okay, why, why in the world does God have this need to, to, to look Joshua, to, to talk to Joshua, and literally to say to him, just after they buried Moses, just after they spent 40 years wandering together, why does he have this need to say to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead? And I think it's, I think it's for this one reason. God wanted to be really clear on what Joshua's current reality was. Here's where you are, here's what's happening. There's nobody else to hide behind. There's no shading. There's, there, 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 there's nothing. Here's where we are, the, the current reality. And my friends, I think if we're gonna move out of this place and we're gonna make this one of the best years ever for Converge, if we're gonna make it uh, 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 more, more and more people populating heaven and less and less people populating hell, I, I think the place that we have to all start is this, that we have a current reality that we have to be very, very real with at this very moment. We, we, I, we live in this state called Iowa. Okay, that's Iowa. This is the place where you fly over and we wave. <laughs> this is the place that has more pigs than people. This is the place where some of you think, oh, Iowa, <laughs> isn't that where they grow potatoes? You know, shut up about that, all right? <laughs> Here's our reality. This is our state. This is where we live. This is the place other people make fun of, but this is the place we're at. And our reality is this, these are our people. And we've got, a, we've got our campus, our, our main campus is right here, it's in, in Cedar Falls, Iowa. And, and, and if, we were gonna, if we were gonna launch campuses around, like for instance, if we lived in Phoenix or Chicago or Minneapolis or, or Orlando or somewhere else, you know, we could have a, a hundred thousand people kind of in this pocket over here that we could, you know, five miles away and another 300,000 two miles away over here and we could, we could do that, but, but that's not our reality. And here's what our reality is in Iowa. That we have a campus that is 11 miles away right here in Waterloo, that's our closest one. We have one up here that's 65 miles away we have one down here that's another 65 miles away. We have one over here that's 95 miles away and one up here that's 45 miles away. And that's our reality. And if we're gonna make a difference in the state of Iowa, if we're gonna, if we're gonna do something, we have to really get used to what our reality is. And in, and in Iowa, this is what it is. And, 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 and so we have to face that and say, if we're gonna make a difference, if we're gonna do something, the, the current reality is this, is, this is where we're planted. 
Here's a, here's a second reality that I think that all of us need to make sure we're, 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 we're tracking with. We need to know here's who I am and here's who I'm not. And I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the scariest things, one of the toughest things for ministry leaders and for pastors, one of the toughest things that, that we have to face is, is, is our own level of, of, of ignorance. There are too many of us, too many of us who, who are caught up in, in what I ought to be or this ideal of what I should be and how I should be gifted and how I should look and, and how I should act instead of the reality of this is who I am and this is how God wired me. Our state right now, this state right here, it is littered, okay? It's littered with dead and dying and empty churches. Littered. And I think one of the main reasons is because they're led by women and men who don't really know who they are or how they're wired and who they're not. If you're going to move forward, if you're going to move forward in, in, in what God's calling you to be, you need to lose the ideal of what I ought to be and lose the ideal of I, I, I want to look like this or I want to be like her or be like him. And you need to get your feet firmly planted in your current reality. This is how I'm wired and this is the way that, that God made me. I met a whole bunch of dudes who are very, very convinced they're supposed to plant churches and very, very convinced they're supposed to be the leader and very, very convinced they're, they're convinced they're supposed to be the preacher. When up to this point in their life, they haven't demonstrated one leadership or teaching gift at all. I've got, I've got my, my, three of my guys here. Where, where are you guys at? Gabe, Jesse, Chris, where are you? Come here, hurry up, hurry up, come here. They hate this, I don't care. Come on. Good hustle. <laughs> All right, come on, right here, just, just real quick. I know you guys love this, I know, I know. Sorry about that. This is Chris, this is Jesse, this is Gabe. Now just, just, just hear me out a minute, okay? I sit around the table with these guys. I've known, I've known Gabe since he was in college and he was our youngest elder that we ever had and he had a job making six figures at Target in the corporation and we paid him way less than half of that to come work for us. This is Jesse, he, he was in college when, when, and he was our part-time student ministries guy and he went off to seminary and we hired him back right out of seminary and we didn't really know what we wanted him to do. We offered him four different jobs, three of which actually existed and, and we just said, just take one, okay? We don't care. Chris and I have been together for 12, is it 12? 12 years. Now, now, now listen, here's the, here's the key. There came, a point, there came a point for me when I had to face this, this, this reality. There's, there's just a lot of stuff I'm not. There's a lot of stuff I'm not. In fact, there's way more stuff that I'm not than, than I am. And if you're afraid to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you, and if you're afraid to surround yourself with people who will challenge you, that I'm telling you that you don't know who you are and you will never make it in this thing. You've got to surround yourself with people who will look you in the eye and, and who, who will love you, but who will tell you what you're not. And, and they'll fill in the gaps where we fill in. And, and us, us four, we have this, this, this deal. Here's what we get to do. We get a knock on each other's door and we get to look each other in the eye and say, hey, you're, you're leaking. In fact, it wasn't too long ago that Gabe came, Gabe came to me and he said, hey, can I talk to you for a sec? I said, sure, you bet, you bet. He goes, hey, you're really leaking. I go, no, I'm not, shut up, okay? <laughs> 10 minutes later, another one of our pastors comes in, hey, just, you doing okay? You're leaking. I said, no, I'm not, get, get, get away from me. All right, right down the line until Chris finally comes in, <laughs> shuts the door and says, hey, idiot. Okay? We gotta lose the me. We gotta embrace the we. And if you don't surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and more capable than you, you're never gonna push farther. Your current reality needs to know here's who I am, here's who I'm gifted, and here's what I'm not. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I forgot you were there. Because it's all about me. <laughs> if 
if you're going to take one, if you're going to move to that next spot this year, this current reality thing is, is real. And it's not just here's where I'm planted and here's what our area is like, but, but here's who I am and, and I can't do it alone. Here's the last part of this one, okay? Your current reality is this. You signed up for ministry, okay? And when you sign up for ministry, it, it, it is gonna be hard. The, 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 Judd Wilhite stood up here and said, it's messy. And, and all of us know that, it, it just is. People are, gonna, people are gonna hurt you, people are gonna leave, and, and things are gonna happen, finances are gonna struggle, it, it, it's just gonna happen. And you signed up for this thing, and when you signed up for ministry, and especially when you sign up that we're gonna, we're gonna keep taking ground, and we're gonna plant churches, and launch campuses, and we're gonna move into neighborhoods, and when you sign up for that, you gotta know it's just not gonna be unicorns on marshmallow clouds pooping Skittles all day. It's just not. And, I, and, I, and, and we know that. And, and, and reality for us is this. Sometimes this job, sometimes what we do, sometimes, sometimes it really sucks, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. But, but if you keep running from that, you'll just be an escape artist. This is what we get to do. And it's messy. But if you do it long enough, here's what you're going to see again and again and again and again. That God always, God always pulls through. God always does. I've got a friend of mine who, who, who lives in Chicago, and he's got a son that needs 24-7 care, physical and, and mental disabilities, 24-7. And it's just a, and, and, and some, of you, some of you might even be in that boat now. I can't imagine the drain. I can't imagine. So we're up in Minneapolis, and we're eating, and I, we're just talking, and I say, Bill, what, how do you do it sometimes, man? How, I, I can't even imagine being in your shoes. And, 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 and a tear trickled down his cheek. And he, he said, you know, here, he said, the winters are the worst in Chicago. You're trapped inside and it's cold and but we've got this grove behind our house. And I've got this spot that I go to. You go, I go out in the grove and there's this spot and it's a, it's a clearing. And he says, sometimes in the winter when I just can't take it anymore. He says, I go out. I drop on my knees and I just cry out to God. He said, here's, here's what God does every single time I do that. A big, fat sparrow will land around me. And I'm reminded that if God can take care of a sparrow, he can surely take care of me. My friends, listen. In order for us to, to go, we got to sit in this one spot. What's my current reality? Where am I planted? And how am I wired? And what am I missing, God? So Joshua gets this message that just simply says, Moses is dead. My friends, there's nowhere to hide. You've been planted where you're planted. You've been wired the way you're wired and you've been equipped the way he's equipped you. That's your current reality. And the sooner you embrace that, the faster you're gonna move. Stay in, in, in Joshua and, and here's, here's the second checkbox. So, so let's listen to what happens. So he says, Moses, my servant, says, so now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. And, and, he, and he just goes down. He says, I'm, I'm going to give you every place where, where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. And your territory extends from, from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the, the Euphrates. And, and, he, and he, just, he just explains. He says, here's what it is. Here's what it is. And, and, and if we're going to move, if we're going to move, we've got to have a level of clarity about what we're called to do, about what God's asking us to be a part of. You've equipped the way you're equipped. You're planted where you're planted. You, you are who you are. And, and, and now God is, is, has to be clear on this. What, 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 what's, what's the next thing? What's, what's he calling us to do? And, and, and for Joshua, it was easy. Here it is. You go across the river. And, and we've, we've fought this a lot. And we've, we've fought because, you know, we, 
you listen to these guys speaking and you read these books and everybody's got these fancy statements and, and all that stuff. And, and until we got real clarity on, on what we're called to do, it, 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 we, 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 we struggled. When we got clarity on this, that God said, I'm putting you in a position, that's the word Iowa right there, to reach Iowa to make it impossible for Iowa people to get to hell. And we finally embraced and we said, this is, this is who we are. And this is what gets us up every day. We think it's a stinking shame that in the middle of America, in, in Iowa, we've got hundreds of thousands of people whose eternity is hell. For the most part, for lack of a relevant, authentic, evangelical church that'll teach them the real truth about Jesus and accept them where they're at and let them take steps. One of the things that we just pound on at our campus, we just pound it. We said, listen, it doesn't matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done. You can look for God here. Because a whole bunch of Iowans walked away from the church a long time ago because what they felt was, I'm not good enough to be here. I don't dress right to be here. I don't talk right to be here. I don't look like them to be here. And we think it's a stinking shame that in Iowa, people are going to hell for, for lack of a church that just says, we love you and bring all your crud with you. And you can look for God in this place. We don't care who you are. We don't care where you've been. We don't even care what you've done. You can look for God here. And when we got clear on that, when we got clear that this is it, and our strategy is to launch campuses into big Iowa, that launch disciples into little Iowa, when we got clear on that, here's what it did for us. Number one, it helped us prevent drift. When you get clarity, when your level of clarity grows up, your drifting goes down. We drift all the time, and, 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 and it's, it's, it's just so common in churches. Scope creep happens. We can be everything to everybody. We can be this, and we can be that, and we can be this, but we can't be. We just can't. And when you have a lack of clarity on, on, on what your calling is and where you're supposed to go and what you're supposed to do, when there's a lack of that, then here's what's going to happen. Your church is going to drift and your people are going to drift. We've noticed this all the time. That when we're not clear on, let's go, and here's what we're doing, and here's where we're going, here's what happens, and people start to do this. There's only two places for people to look if they're not looking out and up. There's only two places to look. The first place is this. Hmm, what are they doing here? Hmm, what about them? Ooh, why are they doing this? Hey, that's not, whoa, look at her. And the second place is to look at me. Look at yourself. But I'm not getting, but they're not doing this for me. And when the level of clarity is, isn't there, your people will drift. And they will drift to gossiping about people and feeling sorry for themselves. And you will not take one ounce of ground, one inch of ground for the kingdom. You'll be putting out fires all the time. See, when you have a level of clarity, you can prevent drift. And here's the, here's the second thing that clarity does, and we've just discovered this. It, it, pushes, it pushes us past fear. When this is who we are, when this is what we're called to do, this is, this is it. When you have a level of clarity, it, it, it pushes you past fear. God called me to this. God set us on this course. Let me just be clear. Fear will be our greatest obstacle. And most of us make most of our decisions based on fear. If we do this, then they might leave. And if we do this, then they're not going to like me. And if we do this, then... And I spent too much of my ministry, too much of my time, too much motivated by fear. See, fear is, a, fear is a great motivator if you're being chased by a lion in the jungle. Fear is a horrible motivator for ministry. And yet most of us, if we were honest, we spend a lot of our time making many of our decisions based on fear. When you have a level of clarity, if this is who I am, 
my reality and my clarity is this is where we're called. This is what we're called to do. And when you have that clarity, you can, you can push through fear. You can, you can move past fear. You just can. You just, don't, don't turn there. But, but in Genesis 3, this is, this is insane to me. In Genesis 3, right, Adam and Eve, they, they sin. And here's what it says. On the heels of the first sin, God comes down. He's looking for him. And what does Adam say? God says, where are you? And here's what Adam says. Well, we saw you, but we hid because we were afraid. On the heels of the first sin, fear overcomes love. My friends, we can't live that way. We can't. And if you get set and here's who I am, here's the way I'm wired, here's, here's what we're called to do and be, you will push past it. Clarity on the mission. Let's go to the third. A sense of urgency. Go back to Joshua. And, and, and you, you, you see in Joshua that he says this several times. So they're gonna get ready to cross. And so in verse 10 it says, so Joshua ordered the officers of the people Go through the camp and, and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you'll, you'll cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is, is, is giving you. Turn over to, to chapter three. And he says, early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim. And, well, <laughs> I'm sure in Hebrew it's Shittim. And went to the Jordan. <laughs> I'm like an eighth grade boy right now. I can't stop. <laughs> Look at verse two. After three days, after three days, they, they went. My friends, what we have before us is an urgency that we need to sense with, with every part of our being. For us to waste another day dreaming big dreams and talking big talks and never stepping and taking action isn't going to get it done. I don't know one person yet who has been dreamed into the kingdom without action. You see, there was an urgency with Joshua. Three days we're going. Three days we're going. And you guys know this. If you're, you're in ministry, you know this. There's, have you noticed that the weekends are relentless, that they come every seven days? Right? And then, then Christmas comes, and then Easter comes, right? And then the spring comes, and summer comes, and then pretty soon it's the fall again, the kickoff season, and then pretty soon it's Christmas, and it's Easter. Have you noticed that? And it's just relentless. It's never going to stop. It's going to keep marching. In, in Psalm 90, Moses says this. He says, hey, the length of our days is 70 years. 80 if we're lucky, 80 if we're blessed. I'm 51. Who's, I need a math person. Give me a math person. $100 bill for a math person. Does anybody know math good? How's that for language? Who's got a calculator? First one up gets a, um, um, yeah, first one up gets um, nothing. Thanks. Right here. Stay right here. Josiah. Okay, so just get ready for me, okay? So if I live 80, if I live to be 80 years, 80 minus 51 is what? 29. 29, 29 times 365 is what? 7,685. If I go to the max that Moses said, I've got 7,000 days left. How many do I have if I make it till tomorrow? One. No, how many last do I have? What do I got? 7,684. Good. I will not say, I will not ask a girl this question. You, how old are you? 39. 39. 80 minus 39 is? 41. 41 times 365. 14,965. You got like 15,000 days left, dude. You got more than me. Hey, but, but, okay, thanks. Let's give, just give him a hand. Good job. Okay, I'll just, all right. Now, here's the deal. 15 years ago, I showed up at 
First Baptist Prairie Lakes. My kids were little. Now my kids are grown and I'm a grandpa. And, and it just happened, right? All the old people are going, yeah. <laughs> it just happened. And it's, it's, it's not going to stop. It's just not. And, and, and our sense of urgency, it needs to be ramped up with this reality. But the longer we stand on the shore and look and say, man, you know, someday, woo, that's going to be cool over there. Yeah! The longer we stand here and look over there, nothing's going to happen. And people are going to continue to, to go to hell around us. And just see this. Verse 14 of chapter 3. So when the people broke, broke camp to, to cross the Jordan, the, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now look at 15. Now the Jordan's a flood state, right? Why not? All during the harvest. Now listen to this. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped. Most of the time, God is going to reward your faith, but you have to get your feet wet first. You, you have to step. The bleeding woman had to move through the crowd and, and stitch her way through and, and touch the hem of his garment before God moved in her life. Peter had to, to step on out of the boat before he saw God move and hold him up. The leper had to cry out and say, cleanse me. My friends, this is the, I mean, this is the A crowd. You, you guys are doing it now and you're getting after it now. But there are too many of us who know that there's this next step that God's calling us to. And we, we've been standing and waiting. Going, man, that's going to be cool someday. My friends, this is the year. This is the year that we're called to, to step where God is asking you to step. This is the year for talking to be done and wishing to be done and this is the year you won't see God's hand until your feet are wet. And God will move. And so, here's the question, okay? This is, this is, this is my state. I know that there's a town it's right here. It's called Storm Lake, Iowa. There's 10,000 people that live in that town, and it's in need of a church that's not afraid of lost people. It's not afraid of the mess. There's another town down the same highway, 20, Independence, that just full of lost people, and it needs something. There's a town right down here called Council Bluffs, Iowa, 65,000 people. They need a church that isn't afraid of messy lost people. What's your next one? What community is next for you? What town is next for you? What city is next? What has God been putting on your heart? Where's God asking you to get your feet wet? So that this year, this year, across our whole nation, we make it really hard for people to get to hell on our watch. Amen? Let's pray right now together. 
Just deep breath with me, okay? <sighs> no guilt, right? No, we're not, no guilt, no, no weird stuff. Oh, this is just, just God. What's, what's God been putting on your heart? What's the next one? What is it? For some of us, we've been sitting on it for a long, long time with all kinds of really good excuses. Oh, I don't have money. Oh, I don't know. We just don't. And for other, others, it's been really, really recently that God has said, there's a community right there. What's the next one? Father, our prayer is this, that you would help us to quit shading our reality. That God, you would give us a level of clarity on the call, on the next one. And God, deep within our hearts, you'd give us a sense of urgency. That if people don't know Jesus Christ, the King of the universe, if people don't submit their lives to him and bow before him, they will spend eternity punished. So God, would you, uh, would you ramp it up in us? Our reality and our clarity and our urgency. We give it all to you, God, and we're at your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.